All right, so a lot has been happening in the online space over the past couple of months. And I haven't shared a lot publicly about some of the Google updates that have happened, but I've been doing a lot of sharing inside my SEO Made Simple course community and during our monthly office hour call. So in October, my office hour call actually was three hours long because I had so much to share about the helpful content update and examples and just anecdotes of how it's impacting the nutrition space specifically. So I wanted to kind of pull the first hour or so of that call and throw it up here on YouTube for you to enjoy because I really think it's that important. So in this first section of the call, I talk about what the Google Helpful Content Update was, what Google is trying to accomplish with this change, and some things to look at with your own site if you've been impacted. So helping you wrap your head around what helpful content really means in the eyes of Google and how to tell whether or not you're in alignment with what Google is now looking for. Then in the next video I publish, I'm probably gonna take the next hour of the call where I talk about my own specific analyses, so not what Google is saying to do, but what I'm seeing in the field and share that as well. So again, this is firsthand experience and observations that I put together right after the update finished rolling out. Super, super, super valuable. As I talk about these things, I'm also addressing live questions that people were having during the call. So I'll jump sometimes back and forth between what's on my slides and what someone's asking in the chat. And I really genuinely think you're gonna love this. So uh, enjoy and I'll just dive right in. I feel like the discussion about um, the August core update that we touched on last month, then rolling in two weeks later right into the helpful content update is like a huge deal in the online business and blogging space and probably will take at least an hour to talk about. And I think it's really important. So um yeah, I think I have a unique angle to share in this call that um, if you've been reading other analyses of the helpful content update, they're great, but everyone's coming at it from like their own niche and how it's impacting their niche. And I haven't seen anyone specifically diving into like health, um, nutrition websites. So that's what I tried to do to prepare for the call today. And there are some interesting things. I do wanna preface this by saying, the update just ended less than a week ago, and really a lot of it is still conjecture. It's like, oh, I'm looking at these things and trying to find patterns, but um, there hasn't really been like solid data analysis or anything like super scientific done that I've seen, uh, which probably because it just takes time. So if you haven't been blogging for that long, Every so often, and I'll talk about this in the slides, there are these massive shakeup updates that happen. The last one was probably in 2018. There's something called the Medic Update, which at the time I had a site that was a little more on the medically nutrition side, and it got like slammed by that update. It did come back. It did recover, but uh, it is a thing that happens. So um, my takeaways are like, don't totally freak out. This does happen from time to time. It seems like every like five or six years, there's like some mega change. Um, prior to that, it was like 2011, 2012. There were two like really big updates targeting backlink spam and SEOs who had been, because prior to that, you could just like build any backlink and it would help you rank. And so that update decimated a lot of SEOs. Um, the medic update decimated people who weren't health experts that were trying to blog about health. So thankfully, I'm like, okay, good thing I went and got a degree because that kind of future proofs us to an extent. Um, there's still obviously a lot more that goes into it, which is what I want to talk about today. So um, if you were hit by this update, I empathize. I understand it can be very jarring and disappointing. Um, but what it really is, is a kind of like a wake up call from Google, like, hey, you might not be in alignment anymore with current best practices. And it sucks when the goalpost moves. Um, you think you're doing it all right and you were seeing good results. And then they're like, just kidding, now you have to do this. So our job as business owners is really like figure out what Google is rewarding now and adapt to that or fade away into like obscurity, right? So that is the world of online business, business in general, like, Imagine what happened. I think about this all the time. And I also kind of feel a little bit like 
we have to be prepared for something like this in the online publishing industry, but like, think about like newspapers and magazines and like all of that changed so much with the advent of the internet. And now here comes AI and things are changing. So it's like, you either hop on board, like what's coming or you stay in the past and you don't adapt and then you probably get left behind. So I, that's why I kind of like online business. It's fun. It's like never a dull moment, but it, it is not something where you can sit back and rest on your laurels. So um, I just want you guys to know that I am currently actively blogging on the nutrition website. Uh, so I have skin in the game. I have data to share. Uh, it's not just like theory and conjecture, um, which can happen sometimes uh, when people, you know, just move into like teaching and they're not doing anymore. So I am doing <laughs> and I have uh, some tips. So Okay, so I did, there were some still some wins this month. It wasn't all bad news. And some people actually got boosted by the helpful content update. Um, so if you were boosted or you didn't really see a change, that is a win. You should be celebrating, like pop the champagne. Um, and if you saw a loss, be in your feelings about it for sure. But then also start thinking about your action plan moving forward. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, okay, so the big news and what I want to focus on here is Google's helpful content update. Um, it ran from September 14th to September 28th. Uh, it seemed like a lot of people who were hit started getting hit around the 18th. Um, so look at your traffic stats in Google Analytics, Google Search Console around those dates and see, did you have like a significant drop off in your traffic in those timeframes? Um, if so, you were probably impacted. And this is not a core update. So this is a weird thing to wrap your head around. Um, it's a new ranking system that's constantly running in the background. It's their helpful content system. And it is a classifier that gets applied to your website based on Google's decision of how helpful your content is overall. And the crazy part is, is they look overall at all the content on your site. And if they think that a large percentage of it is not considered helpful to users, then your whole site gets demoted and loses rankings, even if there is some genuinely helpful content on your site. And so they recommend like, you know, seriously auditing your content and the user experience and all that and making sure that you're creating a helpful website for people <laughs> um, on the internet. And you're not just creating random articles that you think you can rank for to get ad revenue or affiliate income. That's honestly, I think what they're trying to demote in the search results right now. So there is like a whole industry out there of SEO people in the last like five or six years who have really been focused on building these niche sites where they like find opportunity and create a bunch of content, whether they actually have any expertise in it or not. And their goal is just to rank and make ad revenue or um, affiliate income. And that I think is the industry that's getting targeted right now. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, yeah. So this update significantly impacted a lot of people who blog for a living. Um, it's probably the most significant update since the 2018 medic update. And before that, the 2012 Penguin update. So it seems like every five or six years or so, there's something big coming um, from Google. They like kind of scope out the landscape, try to figure out how people are gaming the system and then tweak their algorithm accordingly. So lots of reports from bloggers losing 50% or more of their traffic overnight, which sucks. <laughs> so what the heck was this update about? Again, this is still just like conjecture. No one knows for sure. Um, Google doesn't give away their algorithm, obviously, because then people would just game the system. So what is required to figure it out is people, SEO people, analyzing the changes and trying to come up with what they think uh, is being targeted by this update and analyzing the sites that won versus the sites that lost and trying their best to come up with ideas for what to do to recover. But as always, it's always like test and see. Um, so it will take time for people to figure it out. So don't give up, <laughs> um, keep going. And, but don't keep doing the exact same thing, I think I would say. So figure out who's beating you now and what maybe is better about their website or their content than yours. And what can you do to improve your site? 
So again, the Google Helpful Content System, this was actually released about a year ago in August 2022, and they announced it as this new ranking system that they said was designed to help searchers find genuinely helpful content. And it was a little bit vague, and the first rollout didn't really do much, and people were like, okay, uh, I guess this is this is the thing, but I don't really understand you know, what's happening. It didn't really seem to shake up much of the search results until now. <laughs> so... Um, Google said that their goal with this system was to elevate content created by people for people, that was their original statement, and demote unhelpful content designed just to gain the system, gain rankings, gain traffic. Note, they explicitly said in their documentation that, that SEO in and of itself is not bad. The bad thing is when people are just creating content for the purposes of ranking and not actually helping people or serving someone, you know? So the, this is a quote from their documentation. It says, our systems automatically identify content that seems to have little value, low added value, or is otherwise not particularly helpful to those doing searches. So the things I'm pulling out here, little value, like not great content, low added value is significant. So this is trying to get at people who maybe aren't really experts and they're just like, reviewing what other people posted already on page one and they're like rehashing it in their own way and then publishing that so like what google ends up with is just like a page of kind of the same blog post over and over <laughs> like on page one um so they're looking for like what can you add what's like different what's your special angle or expertise or new insight that you as an expert and a professional are adding to this conversation that type of thing um and then just making sure it's actually helpful to the user so Again, it's a site-wide classifier. So if enough of your content on your website is deemed unhelpful, your entire website will be impacted, not just a few posts. So if you saw kind of like site-wide, a bunch of your posts drop um, significantly, like five or more spots on in the rankings, this probably impacted you. If you just saw like a couple posts drop, then maybe not. Um, it's probably just normal ranking fluctuations. Um, so yes, and then it says, for this reason, removing unhelpful content could help the rankings of your other content. This is like a screenshot from their documentation. The good news is, is that this system is constantly running in the background, and they do say that they continually reevaluate sites and that it is possible to recover from a helpful content update. So this is from their documentation. It says, a natural question some will have is how long will it take for a site to do better if it removes unhelpful content? Uh, so it says, sites identified by this update may find the signal applied to them over a period of months. So essentially, they're saying, even if you make changes, you might not see any, any impact, any improvement in your search results rankings for months. But it says, our classifier for this update runs continuously, allowing it to monitor newly launched sites and existing ones. If it determines that the unhelpful content has not returned in the long run, the classification will no longer apply. So they're basically saying they'll notice if you make changes. They want to see that the changes are sustained over the long term, which is, I think, intentionally vague. And then they'll remove the classifier and your site should bounce back. So... <laughs> That's what we're dealing with here. So it's um, don't expect that if you make changes that things will bounce back immediately. It sounds like that's probably not the case, but over the long run, maybe six months or so, then I would expect to see some improvement if you're changing things up and making improvements. It says the classifier process is entirely automated using a machine learning model. It's not a manual action or a spam action. It's just a new signal that they're using now to rank content. So what people SEOs are probably doing right now is trying to figure out what might machi a machine be able to like look at on your website and create like ranking factors for, and how could we tweak our websites to show that we're helpful um, and make those changes to regain our rankings. Uh, so yeah, then they do specify that in some scenarios, if you're like the only person on the internet who created helpful content on a specific topic um, and there's no one else to show in the rankings, uh, even if you are suffering from this helpful content update, there could be a few posts that like squeak through the cracks and are still able to rank if no one else has published good content. So they're still, uh, first and foremost, 
trying to rank helpful content. But uh, if you overall have not been meeting their um, requirements, I guess, then they are going to demote you wherever they can, unless you're like literally the only person out there with good content on a certain subject. So the rollout dates so far from the helpful content update have been August 2022, December 2022, and then just recently September or December 2022, and then September 2023. And up until now, September 2023, no one really saw much of an impact unless you had like really crazy unhelpful content. Like I think in the last office hours, I showed someone's website that I did think was impacted by one of these past rollouts where she had maybe over 50% of her blog posts on her site were like journal entries from when she was like a dietetic intern, like, oh, here's how OCHEM went this week, like that, all that stuff. I think she was one of the examples of someone who was impacted earlier, but now they like tweaked the dial way harder in September, 2023. And now sites who in the past had been like doing everything right are now getting impacted. So <laughs> uh, yes, again, lots of big traffic uh, losses, especially people known as niche site owners who create um, topical websites and they may or may not actually have any expertise in the subject, but they find a need based on keywords and they try to build a website to meet that need. And I think that's a little bit of what Google's going after here. So as usual, Google is trying to stop people from gaming the system, essentially. Uh, there's people out there who have like a portfolio of sites, I would say like 10 or more websites, all in different niches, but they own all of them. And they're bulk creating um, content on these keywords with the hope of gaining traffic to get ad revenue or affiliate link sales. But they don't necessarily have like, a brand like these are kind of just like fill in the whole website <laughs> where there's opportunity and they're like oh I'm gonna meet that opportunity even if I'm not an expert in this space like oh vacuum cleaner reviews like yep that's me um that type of thing so Google doesn't love that and I think that's what they're trying to go after but since this is all controlled by machine learning sometimes good sites get swept up in this along the way and that's unfortunate but that's the reality um, there was also around between the two updates, a lot of shifting around on mobile devices with, um, the type of content shown. So that seems like, not seems like it, it is in a lot of, um, search results changing so that the results are maybe the top 10 results are maybe only like 50% written content and 50% other content. So like, People also ask boxes, um, video carousels, short form video, um, uh, long form video on YouTube, um, Google web stories, like Google has been like sprinkling those things in significantly more. And I personally think this might be foreshadowing of like what Google sees as the future of their search engine with the incoming of the AI answer boxes at the top. Because it's just like theoretically, it's like, if the answer is given in the AI box and there's links to the websites that it's usually a pack of like six or eight websites that they got this information from, it doesn't make sense for Google to then just repeat those links underneath the AI answer box that already has the links, right? So personally, I think that they're going to be changing it up a little bit to where the information is going to be in the AI box. The links to the places where that information is found is going to be highlighted in the AI box. And then it kind of makes more sense for them to put other types of content underneath the information, like video, web stories, first person experiences, things like that. I think that's where they're going, which is very interesting to me. So um, yeah, I'm brainstorming. I think I'm going to like use my new site as a case study and like experiment with some new form like repurposing content and stuff and maybe like put together a new group of uh if you want to follow along and practice and implement and learn and share I think that's what I'm going to do next um it's very interesting lots of changes coming totally uncharted territory so just got to try stuff and then see what works and share that with other people basically no there is no one out there who knows how to optimize for example the search generative experience boxes yet like 
it's it hasn't even launched to the general public yet. So I will say with our nutritionist answers blog, we do super well in the SGE boxes. Like we're almost always in the first one to three links um, in the answer boxes. So we're doing something right that Google likes. And I find that really interesting. So I'm gonna do my own digging and figuring out. I think it has a lot to do with topical authority personally. Um and and ans doing a good job of answering the query in a really concise way that like the AI can kind of just pull from and regurgitate in the answer box. Um, so yeah, uh, those are things to think about as well. But the main thing, the message that Google has been spreading about their new update is that Google wants to reward people first approach to content. So people first content creators, this is a quote, focus first on creating satisfying content while also utilizing SEO best practices to bring searchers additional value. And then, this is very helpful, they gave a whole bunch of questions to ask yourself to figure out if your content is meeting their targets. So in their documentation about the helpful content update, they gave like dozens of questions. So the first section is about content uh, and quality. So these are the things you should be, if you were hit, these are the questions you should be asking yourself when looking at your site. So number one, does the content provide original information, reporting, research, or analysis? AKA, they don't want just a rehash of the same information that's already ranking on page one. That doesn't really do any good for anyone. So what can you bring to the table that's different? That's, um, I think they call it information gain in their patents. So it's like, Here's the the, no, the knowledge base that exists already. What gain are you adding on top of that with your content? And if you have something unique, um, then that's going to increase their chances of like using your site as like a reference and pulling it into the SGE box and um, wanting to show it basically. So for example, on our Nutritionist Answers blog, um, we create like um, nutrition comparison tables that I haven't seen on any other site <laughs> that's uh, talking about like we do a lot of content of like this food versus this food. And instead of just like, kind of like, le like vague responses, we actually make a chart, like comparing the nutrient values of the food and then discussing it and stuff like that, which is different. It's unique and no one else is doing that. So I think that's part of why it's doing well. Um, and then we cite everything. <laughs> so, uh, I'll talk about that in a second. The next one is, does the content provide a substantial, complete, or comprehensive description of the topic? So I think this is, um, again, getting on the idea of topical authority. So they don't want to see one of the red flags, I think, for their machine learning is like looking at your content you've published and how it relates to each other. How is it categorized? How does it, how are you interlinking between the content? Are you clearly creating like resource hubs about different things that your audience needs to know about? Or is it like a feed of random posts that are just like targeting a keyword you thought you could rank for? You're never linking to other content. It's not organized into categories. Someone's just going to come to your site if they like went to the homepage and they're like, whoa, like where do I find, what can I learn here? Where can I find this information? This like feed of posts is totally overwhelming. I read one post and then I'm lost. I don't know where to go next. Like that's what they don't want to reward. And that's what a lot of like niche site people accidentally did. I think we all knew that internal linking and creating content hubs and stuff was important, but there's a difference between like thinking like, yeah, I should probably do that. And then like actually doing it. Um, so that's another thing to double check on your site. Does the content provide insightful analysis or interesting information that is beyond the obvious? So basically, again, showing that you have expertise and insider knowledge in whatever you're talking about. Uh, if the content draws on other sources, does it avoid simply copying or rewriting those sources and instead provide substantial additional value and originality? Does the main heading or page title provide a descriptive, helpful summary of the content? I don't think any of us were, were doing that incorrectly, but um, sometimes like spammers will try to create like a misleading title to get a click and then the content doesn't actually match the title. Um, does the main heading or page title avoid exaggerating or being shocking in nature? Uh, we don't do that either. Um, is this the sort of page you'd want to bookmark, share with a friend, or recommend? That's a big one. Um, are you proud of your site? Is it like 
you, I saw someone in one of the Facebook groups say like, would you go out around town wearing like a t-shirt with your brand name on it for your website? Like, are you genuinely excited about like, this is the best website on this topic. Like I need to share this with the world. This is here to help people. Um, that kind of vibe versus like, oh, you know, I'm doing a zillion and one things. And like, I post one, one post a month on my website because I found a good keyword and like, I'm hoping to make like some extra side money with ads. Like that, that was a viable model for a long time. And I'm not sure that it really is anymore moving forward. So I think we need to all like step up our game essentially. Um, nothing wrong with ad revenue, but um, if that's like your sole goal and it's kind of like a side project, it's a harder journey than it was, I would say. It's like Google's wanting to show brands more than just like little websites, if that makes sense. Um, let's see. Would you expect to see this content in or referenced by a printed magazine, encyclopedia, or book? So that's like the benchmark of quality that they're going for. Um, does the content provide substantial value when compared to other pages in the search results? We kind of do that already. If you've been doing your, your work in the SEO course and looking at what already ranks and trying to create something better, then that should already be working in your favor. Does the content have any spelling or stylistic issues? So hopefully you're doing spell checking and grammar checking. Um, if not, definitely do that. Um, but also stylistic issues. So this brings in the topic of UX, user experience. And a lot of SEOs looking at this update think that user experience is playing a significant role. So if your content just like looks off, like it's not professional, it looks like a website from like the 2000s or the spacing is all weird or the font size is not good or whatever, just like not a good user experience, that could be playing a role here as well. Um, is the content produced well? Does it appear sloppy or hastily produced? And is the content mass produced by or outsourced to a large number of creators or spread across a large network of sites so that individual pages or sites don't get as much attention or care? So they don't want to see mass produced, low quality content, essentially. They're like, please give us something worth showing. And I personally think that part of this is because of AI coming, they have this like huge database, this huge knowledge graph of information that they're gonna pull from and show in the search generative experience, which is like the new box that's coming here. I'll show you an example in case you haven't seen yet. Um, Google. Um, what can I type in? Uh, I'll just do one of my words. So, Here's the what's coming, an AI box. Here you can see our website is number one um, and they're giving all the information. So it's kind of like, I don't know where this is gonna go in the future because if they de-incentivize people to publish information, then the AI is not gonna have anything to draw from. I don't know if we'll get compensated in the future if you're like a good content producer or what, but they're taking the content <laughs> that exists and putting it in this response. And then they're putting links over here on desktop, the links are on the right and you can kind of scroll through like this, um, but on uh, mobile, they're underneath the response. And then sometimes there's pictures or video here. So I haven't gotten around to doing this on all of our posts yet, but um, this is something I'm working on optimizing for as well, creating images that address and videos. I haven't done videos yet, but that's what I'm gonna do next. Uh, that target the queries that might get displayed here as well. So, um, yeah, so my thought process is if the basic information is here, what value are you adding on top of that? And then desktop still hasn't changed much. As you can see, it's pretty much just articles. But if you look this up on your phone, you'll probably see something pretty different. Um, there's a lot of changes on mobile and more people search on mobile than on desktop. So I'm just gonna do it right now and see, I'm just curious. This is more of an informational keyword, so it might not have as many other things, but okay, I'm looking it up on mobile and I see the search generative box. People also ask our blog post, two other blog posts, then a pack of videos, which are mostly YouTube videos, also a Facebook video. 
um, another blog post, um, another blog post, another blog post, images, and another blog post. So that one's still pretty blog post heavy, but depending on the query, I highly recommend if you haven't signed up to be a tester for the search generative experience, totally recommend doing that. Um, if you're at, on Google on your phone and you're logged in, there's like a little, it looks like a little beaker at the top of the, here, let me stop sharing my screen. So here, there's a beaker up here. If you click that, it gives you the option to sign up as a tester for new things. So you can sign up to get this AI search generative experience thing now um, before it rolls out. And then you can try to work on seeing how your content is currently performing. They're still testing it, obviously, um, but it's hypothesized to run out or to roll out um, by the end of the year to at least a portion of people online. So super interesting, super cutting edge. It's really interesting and exciting to me, but um, I just saw a study that someone did and published in search, uh, search Engine Land, maybe, or Search Engine Journal, one of the SEO websites, and they estimated that they think a lot of websites are going to see from the AI responses are going to see anywhere from like a 20% to like an 80% drop in traffic if they're focused mostly on informational queries, which is like, ah, so yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to look at the chat in a second, but um, they said there were, so they've tried to run these like hypothetical models. So basically they think that click-through rate for, for the um, answers in the box here. Let me share my, share my screen again. Click-through rate for these links here is going to be lower than what was currently shown with the featured snippets, which is probably right. Because why would, if they're giving like literally this whole breakdown here, it's like, do you really need, I mean, some people need more information, but probably a lot of people don't. Like this is like enough to answer their query really. Um, so will they click? Who knows? And obviously it's very like niche dependent and type of query dependent even. But in this scenario, probably not. Like this is like kind of enough information to answer your question without clicking anything. So we shall see what's going to happen with, with this um, moving forward. Uh, everyone's in the same boat and we're just kind of watching and waiting. Um, but yeah, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, let me pull up the, the chat. Where did it go? Judy said, would you expect to see this con content in or referenced by a magazine or book sounds AI related? What do you think about protecting blog content and AI? Yeah, I feel like I'm kind of like, is that what you mean? Like um, what's happening with AI? <laughs> we'll see. I think we're going to have to shift. And the, those, so what can't AI do? It can't do videos with your face in it. So you can become... Uh, more of a visual authority. So taking your blog content and creating video content around it and publishing it on YouTube is potentially somewhere to go. And additionally, um, short form video as well. So YouTube shorts, TikTok, Instagram reels, um, taking the content and repurposing it basically. So you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to make like all new content. Oh, and web stories. Um, all ideas <laughs> to create new forms of content that AI can't compete with in the same way. And that also might start getting a lot more preference in the search results if text is being covered by AI. So I can, I don't know, I'm guessing, but I can see a future where it's like, okay, Google, answer my question for me. And it gives you the text answer at the top. And then you're like scrolling through and you're like, okay, cool. Like here's a cool YouTube video about a professional expert in this topic also giving me more information. I'm going to watch that. Or like, oh, there's a quick YouTube short around this topic. Like, I think that's where they're going. And I think part of this is like tying into the news that like, oh, the younger generations are using TikTok for search, for example. I think they're feeling a little threatened by that and are trying to like, cater to the younger crowd and different formats of content that people are consuming today. So I don't know. It's all just a guess, but this is my gut feeling. Um, but we'll see. Um, Jeanette said, would some big sites like Healthline, Medical News Today, et cetera, be penalized since they have a large source of writers? Or does it need to be both mass and poorly written to be penalized? Um, Healthline has been dropping like a rock, <laughs> to be honest. I think they are in some ways getting penalized by these types of updates. Um, 
but not everything. So again, depending on what they're writing about, sometimes they are still the best piece of content. So they're still getting rankings, but they look at this graph. It was like their heyday until, what is this? They had a, a strong run until about April, 2021. And then it's been like downhill from there. So yes, I think in some ways they are getting significantly hit. And um, I think some of it came when basically their strategy in the beginning was they were like purchasing other smaller blogs. So they acquired like authority nutrition and then they fired, not fired, but they were paying very, very well. I was one of the writers. <laughs> I was getting a thousand dollars an article, which was amazing. And there was unlimited. You could write as many articles as you wanted in a month. So if you were fast, you could make a lot of money writing for them. And then they got acquired by Helpline. And then it slowly was like, oh, we're dropping the payment by 20%. Oh, we're dropping the payment again. Oh, we're dropping the payment again until it was down to like $250 an article. And then they started outsourcing to non-experts. So they were hiring people with no credentials to write the articles. And then they were just having medical experts review the content. So I do think, I think their quality took a hit based on some of their editorial decisions. And now it's like kind of coming to bite them in the butt. So that's my thought there. Um, Alex said, looks like relying on ad revenue is not going to be viable in the future. I think it depends on your niche. I think food blogging is still okay because AI is not out there like cooking um, or anything where you require like firsthand experience, maybe crafting, like, you know, those types of blogs, but informational blogs, I do think are in trouble. So something to think about depending on your niche. Um, Jeanette said, this may sound bad, but I do like using the AI function for quick questions. If I'm looking something up, I know I do too. So I think, I think this is the future and it's like an adapt or die moment. And I think all we can do is like, try to be ahead of the game by even knowing that this is coming. You're already ahead of the game. <laughs> like there's so many people in the world who have no idea. So, um, by thinking about it now, you are maximizing your chances of adapting early and benefiting in that way. Um, Sue said, is it worth it to spend more time doing video and limiting blog posts to one a week? Possibly. I mean, <laughs> no one knows for sure. I think what I would do if I, before you go there, I would look at your top keywords, Google it on a phone because vi more video shows on phone than on desktop and look to see if there's video packs in the results, if there's short video in the results, if there's web stories in the results, if there's images, image packs in the results. And if you see any of those things, then I would what I would do is kind of systematically as you're going through and maybe updating your content, um, work it into your processes to be like, okay, I'm updating this post that dropped in the rankings. I'm also noticing that um, there's short form video ranking really high in the search results on mobile on this topic, and there's web stories. So part of my updating of the content. I'm going to refresh the blog post and make it as good as it can be based on the current expectations from Google. And I'm going to also work on repurposing. So, um, and I think I'm going to create like some tutorials and share, uh, like how to do web stories and like ideas on how to make YouTube videos, um, soon, but it's a lot of work. So I'm going to do it myself and then share my processes. So, um, be on the lookout for something new from me. Um, still, pinning down the details, but that's where I'm thinking of going, um, in the future. Um, but yeah, that's what I would do. I, so I wouldn't like do it without first analyzing the search results, because if you're making, let's say a web story or a video, but that's not being shown in the search results, then it might be a waste of time. But if it's there and you can take one of those spots, then like totally go for it. Um, do you think we need to do talking head for videos or can image videos work just as well to compete with AI? I think it's, you gotta look and see what's like ranking. I think it's harder if you're doing a faceless YouTube channel, um, depending on your topic. So I think if you're talking about anything, uh, YMYL, you should show your face. So if you're doing anything health related, I think realistically long-term Google's wanting to show experts. So it's like, who are you? show me you're a real person, show me you're a real expert in this space, show me your firsthand experience. And that's part of that is showing you. If you're doing like celebrity gossip, then yeah, maybe not. Like you could just show, you know, like the latest news and, and do a voiceover and that would probably do fine. 
but it's, I think, so it depends on your niche, but I think if it's anything health related, then I do think you need to show your face. If you're doing recipes, maybe not, you can just do hands in pan style video. Um, that still does well, but, uh, yeah, for anything with YMYL, I think they want to know you. They want to show content from, from experts. That's the differentiator between AI and like expertise. I think that an experience that they're going for. Um, is it bad for your Google search traffic to have ran to have a randomly a random publishing schedule? Let's say, for example, publishing ten per month and then taking two weeks off. Um, no, that's fine. Uh, I think as long as you're not taking like six months off. <laughs> I mean, realistically, I've taken years off some of my websites and they're still doing fine. Uh, so it depends, I think, on the niche. Like for food, my website somehow is still doing like pretty well. It's still getting like 100,000 people reading it every year. And I haven't touched it in like six years. <laughs> so um, that one didn't fall off a cliff. And then my nutritionist one also hasn't been updated in years. And it's kind of, it got a drop when I stopped publishing, but then it kind of held steady at that drop. I think it's getting, I don't know, maybe like 5,000 people a month reading it with just 20 blog posts maybe. So um, yeah, I think if you stop publishing and you're in a competitive niche, you might see a drop, but taking two weeks off is nothing in the blogging space. You could take months off before you would see any sort of negative impact. I think if you can hit a regular cadence, it might make it easier for Google to um, know how often to recrawl your website and look for new content and index it more quickly. That could be a consideration, but um, yeah, I don't think that would make a big that big of an impact. Um, how long do you think videos should be? Totally depends on the query. It's kind of like blogging. It's like, how long should a blog post be? Well, what's the question? What's the answer? What do people need to know to satisfy their question and that's what you should be making so um something that's like getting to the point helping someone and that's it <laughs> so uh look at what people are doing already that's ranking well and try to do better just like blogging <laughs> um if you are blogging as a side to your private practice and posting on your professional site with your credentials do you still need to take any extra measures to display your face or videos and posts or is it only for youtube so if you have a private practice, I think that's actually helping you in this uh, latest round of updates. So one of the things I found um, is that the, some of the winning websites, there's, it seems like Google is promoting people with demonstrable firsthand experience. So they have a private practice. You can book an appointment with them. They're selling a product. They're selling a service. They're selling a course. They're like clearly in the business of helping this niche versus the people who are like, here's some information bye, like that's not going over so well anymore. So um, I think if you have a private practice and you're posting with your name, um, I would work a little more perhaps on getting your name mentioned in other publications to help Google understand who you are and what you're an expert in and until you're able to get a knowledge panel. So like guest posting on other reputable sites, being a contributor on other reputable sites, getting mentioned as a, a quote, a quoted expert in the media in your niche. I think that would move the needle the most. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you can do video, I'm, I don't think that would hurt you. I think that would only help you, but I don't think you have to do it. Um, it's just something to think about if you were hit particularly by this update, um, perhaps a way to like revamp your reputation and look more helpful in Google's eyes and possibly future-proof yourself for the future of search. But this is all conjecture. So do that with, do with this information what you want. Um, we'll see. So Amy said, my website is up 10% and it's one, I'm wondering if it's because I have tons of references. I do think that's playing a role. I saw um, Casey Marquis is like an SEO expert in like specifically the food blogging space. And he just published this morning um, his analysis of how this is impacting food bloggers. And one of his main points was uh, the people that saw big drops in the food blogging space were food bloggers without any credentials making health claims and not backing them up. So they were saying like, this is this recipe is so good for your heart health and like you can lose weight and all these health claims. 
They weren't dietitians. They weren't linking to any sources. And those types of sites, a lot of them saw drops. So it, you, you could be onto something for sure. Um, good references, good images. Yeah, Google loves unique images. So anything you can add, if you can add any like helpful image, um, even just a good featured image, I, I have found the same thing. We are just making good featured images for a lot of hosts and those are showing up. We're getting a thousand visitors a month just from images. Um, so yeah, uh, and a few of them are more optimized. Like if we wrote a blog post on like, I think we have one that's like acorn squash nutrition. And then we made like a little pretty graphic with like highlighting some of the, the like high in XYZ nutrient or whatever um, type of graphic. And that's doing well. Uh, they love to see original things like that because that's another way that you can stand out in a way that AI can't. So um, something to think about as well. And plus you can share those on social media and Pinterest and get more traffic <laughs> in that way as well. Uh, okay, so back to my slides. Next, they tell you to assess your expertise. So they say, does the content present information in a way that makes you wanna trust it? Such as clear sourcing, ding, 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 evidence of the expertise involved. So part of that is all the EEAT stuff that we talk about in lesson five. So again, if you haven't watched that, please watch that and implement. Um, background about the author or the site that publishes it. So you need a clear about page. You need author bio pages if you have more than one author. Um, if, is it okay, sorry, side question. Is it okay to cross post images to social or do we have to modify it first? Yeah, you can post it on social. I think it depends on the platform. Uh, and the type of image that each platform likes. Um, so perhaps you wanna change it a little, like Pinterest likes vertical graphics. I mean, I haven't done Pinterest in a while, so I have to double check if that's still best practice. But from my past experience, they like to show um, more vertical images, not like square images. They do The vertical ones take up more space and like tend to get more clicks in Pinterest um, versus like Instagram, probably a little more square format would be better. So, um, in the past, I what I was doing was I had different templates on, this was on my nutritionist blog, I had different templates in Canva, and then I would kind of just like resize the information to like fit the different formats. Uh, and then I would post them like on Instagram, like I'd make like carousels for Instagram. And then on Pinterest, it would just be like one long infographic type of thing. Um, so I do think that like, you know, uh, Customizing to the platform will get you better results. Um, how do you determine image visit, visit, bleh, image visit, visit results? <laughs> um, you can find that in Google Search Console. So let me let me show you. Uh, Google. So Google Search Console. Um, okay, so this is our Nutritionist Answers blog. We got a, a bump, an increase from the August core update, and then the helpful content update brought us pretty much back right to where we were. So when I looked at this comparison, it was literally 0% change. So I'm like, okay, that's a win. Uh, at least I wasn't hit. Um, so let's see, what was I looking at? Oh yeah, um, so you go to search results. And then by default, it shows you the web search results. So people clicking on your blog posts. But if you click this, if you have other types of content like images or video, in this case, I only have images, I don't have video. Um, you can click image and then you can see um, over the last three months, we've gotten over 3000 people clicking on our images in the search results. Uh, so it's over a thousand people a month on average. Uh, from that. And you can see which queries specifically your images are ranking for, and then also what pages um, are getting the clicks. So that's that's how you figure that out. Um, okay. Uh, la, la. If someone is, uh, the second question, if someone researched the site producing the content, would they come away with an impression that it is well-trusted or widely recognized as an authority on its topic? So this is one of the things I think I touched on in the new updates in the course as well. Like what comes up when you Google your name or your brand name? And if it's not like showing off, if it's, if it seems unclear, if, if it's not like 
if you Google your own name and it's not like this is this person and they do this and this is what they're an expert in and you don't have a knowledge panel, like then that's an area to work on. And if you Google your brand name and it's like all that comes up is like maybe your site and then like totally unrelated things on the rest of page one, that's another place to, to work on. Like optimize your social channels, optimize your LinkedIn, um, optimize everything you can related to your brand uh, so that you're controlling like the narrative. Jeanette said on the Simple Pin podcast, I heard uh, Casey Marquis say not to use Pinterest images in your actual post anymore. Instead, just use them in the recipe card because Google didn't like it. Uh, yeah, so it depends on your niche, obviously. So um, Pinterest images for recipes is pretty different than like an infographic. So Pinterest pin images for recipes is usually like the title of the recipe and then like a couple pretty images and that's not really like doing anything for the user so yes i would not embed that in the post you can set it up so that when you click the pin button it will bring that up as an option behind the scenes but you don't see it in the post but for um for like nutrition blogs for example if you're making an infographic for example that summarizes the information shown in the content like you wrote out like 10 tips for this. And then you made a pretty infographic that is value add. It's not just like some pretty pictures in the title of the post. If that's what you're doing, then no. But if you're doing like actual information in an easy to consume way, Google loves that. So I would put that in the content and let it display and let it rank. So yeah, that's my answer there. <laughs> um, uh, is this content written or reviewed by an expert or enthusiast who is dem demonstrably knows the topic well? Keyword, you have to be able to demonstrate that you know it well. So it's not enough for you to know, duh, Google, I'm a dietitian. I went to school for this. Like I worked in this field for 10 years. Do they know that? Is that clearly stated in your bio? Is it in your LinkedIn profile? Do you have links to the places you worked at? In your schema, you can specify this type of stuff. So I talk about this again in the updated version of the SEO course. Um yeah, so making sure you are sending all the possible signals about your experience and your expertise and your authority so that Google knows that um, clearly. And does the content have any easily verified factual errors? Hopefully not, right? <laughs> um, and then they say answering yes to the questions below probably means you're on track for providing good page experience. So this is again now tying back into the user experience concept. So number one, does the page have good core web vitals? So site speed. We have a lesson on that in the course as well. Are the pages served in a secure fashion? In 2023, everyone's website should be secure by default. It's very rare that I see unsecure pages anymore. Um, everyone's hosting provider takes care of this 99.9% .9 of the time. But if you ever see a security error, definitely fix that. Um, does content display well for mobile devices when viewed on them? And I've seen some conjecture. I think this was also in Casey Marquis's um, article about the food blogging space. In his um, analysis, he found that specifically in the food blogging space, so in the food blogging space, it is largely ad revenue. That's how most people are making their money. They're not really selling anything. They're just like, churning out recipes, people view them and they get money from the views, right? Um, but a lot, not so a lot of the, the websites that he saw that dropped had really poor page experience in terms of ads on the site and especially how that looked on mobile. So if you open up your website on mobile and it's like ad, ad, a little bit of content, oh, an ad popping up, oh, I click jump to the recipe, oh, I'm at an ad again like all of those things, those are bad for the user experience and probably hurting you. So like dialing it back a little bit to more moderate ad displays, making sure that your ads aren't disrupting the user experience on mobile or anything else, like a pop-up that you had that took over the whole screen, hard to X out of, like anything that's not good for the user experience, change that. Um, like for example, does the content lack an excessive amount of ads that distract from or interfere with the main content? So if your gut reaction to your site on mobile is like, ooh, like there's a lot of ads, like where's the content? This is hard to read. You're probably hurt from that. And then do pages lack intrusive interstitials? So they don't wanna see, interstitials are basically pop-ups. They don't wanna see things popping up, interrupting your experience on the page um, right off the bat. So don't have a pop-up <laughs> covering your whole screen. Um, that's not good either. How easily can visitors navigate to or locate the main content of your pages? So 
but this is again talking about like above the fold like is it like hey here's the content that you want to see after you click the link or is it like add add like um you know just random unhelpful stuff they have to scroll forever to find what they're looking for um that's part of the user experience and then is the page designed so visitors can easily distinguish the main content from other content on your page so i talk about this in the updated course as well but it's like making sure that it's clear like what the content is versus an ad and um making it easy for people to find what they're looking for essentially so just go on your own site especially on mobile things can get wonky on mobile <laughs> and do you enjoy being on your site on mobile and if not put it on your high priority list to do a redesign or whatever you need to do uh, to make it a better uh, user experience more professional a place that people want to be and consume information on essentially and then there's more focus on people first content so content created primarily for people and notably in this latest update they took out so in the original update they said they were trying to reward uh, content created by people for people and they took out the created by people and now it just says creative for people so a lot of people are taking that to mean okay ai is like getting the green light from google they don't care if you use AI as long as it's still helpful content for people, um, at least reviewed by an expert before being published. So um, they don't want to reward things being published just to manipulate search engine rankings. So they want you to be able to say yes to these questions. So number one, do you have an existing or intended audience for your business or site that would find the content useful if they came directly to you? This is a huge piece that I think a lot of niche site owners are missing. Um, so in the, you know, the make money from your blog space, a lot of people are like, oh, whatever, who cares what your homepage looks like? People are going to find you through your blog by Googling a keyword. They're going to read that post and they're going to bounce. But what you end up with, if you focus on that type of experience is like all these disparate pieces of content that aren't really related, that aren't serving a unique person or audience their homepage has been neglected because they're like, ah, no one visits my homepage anyway. But Google's trying to bring us back and be like, wait, take a sec, take a second. If someone was recommended to go to your site and they typed it in and visited the homepage and be like, oh, I'm so excited to go to this XYZ site and learn about whatever your niche is. What is the experience? What are they seeing on your homepage? Is it clear what value you provide and where they can find the information on your site? And are there sections and categories and services or products that you offer to help them? Or is it like a list of blog posts and like, that's it, you know? Um, so really rethinking like what you're putting forward as your brand messaging on your homepage and the experience for like a new person coming to your site for the first time. Um, does your content clearly demonstrate firsthand experience and depth of knowledge? For example, expertise that comes from having actually used a product or service or visiting a place. And in the nutrition niche, I noticed that they are giving a boost to practitioners. So people who have offices, who have firsthand experience seeing patients, who have a tab on their website that says services or like work with me or something like that, or they sell a course or a membership, like they are helping people firsthand. Um, that was a clear thing that jumped out at me. So something to think about. I would recommend also just for the sake of like income diversity and future proofing yourself as well and having more control over your online business. If you can come out with a product or a service for your audience, I would. I would do it. Um, it it's a lot of times more profitable than just focusing on ads and it's more in your control. So is if you are using your content to build an audience, you can then have people join your list. And when once you're on your they're on your list, you at least have a direct connection to them and you can continue to serve them, even if your rankings fall off a cliff. You still have your core group of people who voted and said, Yes, I'm here's my email. I want to hear from you. How can you help me? How can you help them? You know what I mean? Like thinking about building a business that's helping and not just a content hub, if that makes sense. Um, does your site have a primary purpose or focus? After reading your content, will someone leave feeling they've learned enough about a topic to help achieve their goal? And will someone reading your content leave feeling like they've had a satisfying experience? So did they get everything they want and they don't have to go anywhere else? That's your, that should be your goal. Um, 
Jessica said, I noticed that when I Google my name, basically I come up several times, except the first one is someone posting on Twitter. Is there a good way to override that? There's also an obituary and then some other people in images. Any good tips to make it more of a suite for me? Yeah, media mentions. So uh, get out there, try to get quoted everywhere you can. Be featured on podcast interviews. Um, optimize your LinkedIn. Start publishing there if you can. Um, basically try to become noteworthy and known in your niche. That's, I think, the the like secret uh, for the long term, but it's hard. So people don't want to do it. Um, it's not really enough to just be like, here's some content, but it's like my side thing. I just do it on the weekends. Like they want, they want to feel like they're showing content from like people who like live and breathe their niche. It's like, this is me. This is what I know. This is what I'm an expert in. Here's why you should trust me. Here's a book I wrote. Here's a course I made. Here's a membership I offer. Here's a podcast I have. Here's my videos. Like showing like that you are someone to trust. Here's my services. Here's my private practice. Like, you know what I mean? Like not just a blog with content with ads, unfortunately, because I'm sad a little bit. I think it's again, still viable in some niches, crafting, um, food, things like that. I think it's still viable, but information, especially if it's health related, they're like, they want to see experts. Um, so how are you an expert? And I did update a lot of this in the, uh, course on the most recent round because YouTube came, as I mentioned, they came out with these guidelines was super interesting all about how they decide who's an expert on YouTube and they were super explicit in like what they're looking for and so uh, yeah I included that all in the latest updates to the course and if you do those things I think that's going to help you as well so yeah the way to to beat it is to become more known on the internet <laughs> and try to get your name out there like PR basically um with your business and your brand um, and honestly, I know writing a book is like not a small thing to do, but that's one of the biggest ways that I've noticed people get uh, knowledge panels. So Google has like their Google authors database. And so if you write a book, <laughs> um, that's a clear way of them saying, this is this person this is what they're known for. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure with the ebook, cause I haven't published anything myself, I think if it was just an ebook on your own website that you publish, I, I don't think that would qualify as being like an author in Google's eyes. But if it was a book that you self-published on Amazon, um, I think that would probably be enough to get inside the, the um, author database. Lots to do, but it's exciting to me. Yeah, I mean are we, is this our business or is this the hobby? You know, like if you really want to make this like your thing, this is your like rise to the challenge moment. <laughs> um, it's just pushing you to do, to take it to the next level. It's like Google being like, okay, no more coasting. If you're like giving out information that can like significantly impact someone's life, like show me that you are an expert and then I'll reward you hopefully <laughs> with some better rankings. Yeah, if Twitter is at the top, if it's possible to move, I think the only, well, I think it depends. Um, if you become more of an authority, then if people are Googling your name, Google will know like, oh, they're looking for this person and they'll be more likely to show you above Twitter if that person on Twitter is not you. But most likely, yeah, right now they're that's beating you out because of the domain authority. Um, so you could also work on improving your own Twitter <laughs> uh, and maybe take that spot as well. Or if and when you're able to get a knowledge panel, if they link to a Twitter profile, it's possible that they'll link to the wrong one if the other one is like more active. And then you can claim the knowledge panel and be like, oh, actually, that's not me. Here's my Twitter. And then they'll swap it out. And um, so that's another possible <laughs> way to, to do it. And then one more question. I think this may have been asked already, but if you Google your keyword and no video pops up, is it worth it to make one? I would put that on like the lowest priority. I would do all the ones that have video first and then maybe move on to ones that don't have video. But again, look on mobile because if you're on your phone, more video shows on phone than on desktop. It's not something that maybe you wouldn't do in the long run once you like run out of other ones to optimize. But I think I would start with the ones that clearly have a video carousel to optimize for. Um, otherwise they might not show the video if they don't think video is what would help someone the most or they might not be showing video because they don't have any video to show. So it's hit or miss. It'll probably be like 50-50. You'll never get it seen on, on the 
on the search results because they don't think it meets the intent or they'll start start showing you and only you because you're the only one so <laughs> who knows that in that scenario it's going to be a hit or miss so I, that's why I wouldn't start with that one um, okay, and then a few more things Google <laughs> put out. I know they put out a lot. Avoid creating search engine first content. So we recommend that you focus on creating people first content to be successful with Google search rather than search engine first content made primarily to gain search engine rankings. So they want you to answer yes to these questions. Number one, is the content primarily... Um, Oh, sorry. They want you to answer no to these questions. Answering yes is bad. So is the content primarily made to attract visits from search engines? If the answer is yes, then that's a sign that you're not targeting people. You're trying to get rankings and ad revenue, perhaps. Are you producing lots of content on many different topics in hopes that some of it might perform well in search results? I know I started to get a little guilty on that in our newest site. So I'm going back to the, the content hub idea of like, if someone wanted to know, like on that site, for example, we're writing about food. So my my grand vision was to have like content hubs on each food. And it would be like um, all the nutrition related questions that someone has about this food, like here's the answers. And then also like a pillar post of like what I think from a user experience perspective, like summary, almost like a Wikipedia page on the food. That was my like grand vision for the site, but we kind of skewed a little into like targeting easy keywords and that's probably not great. So if that happened to you, then time to rework your content strategy possibly as well and really think like, what topics do I want to be known for? How do I cover that vertical really deeply and create a rich hub about that information on my website, interlink between the posts um, and make my site a resource that people would want to come to for help and not just articles. Um, are you using extensive automation to produce content on many topics? This one, I can say I have a firsthand example of a site in my niche that is using clearly AI and they are killing it in the search results. I'll show you in a second. But um, I think the key here is the on many topics uh, part. So Automation in and of itself is not necessarily bad, but if you're using it to kind of spam the results and covers every unrelated topic in your niche and you're not doing a good job of like categorizing and structuring the content on your site, that might hurt you. Are you mainly summarizing what others have to say without much added value? This could happen when a person writes the content. It could also happen when AI writes the content. So use your critical eye and be like, I'm the expert. What do I know about this topic that I think needs to be here that I'm not seeing? Um, do that. Are you writing about things simply because they seem trending and not because you'd write about them otherwise for your existing audience? So are you riding the wave and trying to like, you know, game the system a little bit? Um, or is this a genuine thing that you think your people need to know? Does your content leave readers feeling like they need to search again to get better information from other sources? Are you writing to a particular word count because you've heard or read that Google has preferred word count? No, we don't. Uh, did you decide to enter some niche topic area without any real expertise, but instead mainly because you thought you'd get search traffic? Does your content promise to answer a question that actually has no answer, such as suggesting there's a release date for a product, movie, or TV show when there is not one confirmed? Are you changing the date of pages to make them seem fresh when the content has not substantially changed? So yes, updating content is important, but you have to actually update it, not just like change the date and then change, you like added a period to a sentence, you know what I mean? Um, and are you adding a lot of new content or removing a lot of older content because you believe it will help your search rankings by somehow making your site seem fresh? So I think um, some people related to the last updates kind of misinterpreted what Google was saying. And they're just like adding and removing content a bunch of times, trying to make it seem like fresh on their site. Um, and that's not what Google wants or is trying to reward. And then the last two things, three things. Number one, who created the content? So this is tying into the EEAT stuff. Um, is it self-evident to your visitors who authored your content? So this is something that I've been trying to bring home a lot in the last year or so. Like, do you have your author name listed in your byline? Is it your full name with your credentials? Or is it like some weird username like NutraGirl247 or something? Um, that can accidentally happen <laughs> depending on your WordPress settings. Make sure your name is in the byline 
And as much as you can try to keep the way that your name is written consistent across all of your platforms. So like if you want to use your credentials on your name, use it in your byline, use it on your LinkedIn, use it on your social profiles, keep the same name and credentials uh, written everywhere. So it helps Google understand that you're all the same person. Um, and then link that name in your byline to either your about page, if you're just a solo person on your website, or to an author page with more information about you if there's more than one contributor on your site. Um, so yeah, do pages carry a byline where one might be expected? So the byline should have your name um, and also the date of the publication or the last updated date or both. Um, you want to see that. And then if you have a medical reviewer, you want that in there as well. And do bylines lead to further information about the author or authors involved, giving background about them and the areas they write about? So make sure, um, I'll show you an example. I've shown this before, but on my uh, Nutritionist Answers site, um, go to one of mine. So the byline name links to our author page, and then it's very clear, like credentials, education, experience, photo, who am I, <laughs> what do I do, and then my recent posts. So like, there should be no guessing, it should be very immediately clear, like, why you're qualified to write about this um, just by glancing, not like, hi, I'm Erica. I live in California. I love dogs. Like that, that information has a place if you want to like personalize your content, but make sure that the part about your EEAT is like extra, extra clear. Um, and use your full name. So that's another mistake I've been seeing um, in about pages. People are like trying to become this like known authority in the health space, but then on their about page, it never says their full name. It's just like, hi, I'm Erica. And it's like, Erica who? Like, there's like 50 million Ericas in the world. So like repeating your name, your full name that you want to be known as with your credentials, if that's relevant uh, on your about page. So for example, I could probably put my credentials on here somewhere as well. I don't really have it. Oh, I do right here, but I should probably also put it up here. Um. Okay. So that's the who. <laughs> So if you're clearly indicating who created the content, you're likely aligned with the concepts of EEAT and on a path to success. We strongly encourage adding accurate authorship information, such as bylines, to content where readers might expect it. Then they say, time to assess how your content was created. Um, so for example, with product reviews, it can build trust with the readers when they understand the number of products tested, what the test results were, how the tests were conducted, et cetera. So might not really apply to our niche. Um, in the newest version of the course where I talk about EEAT, uh, for our niche, what's more relevant is your editorial guidelines. So I included a whole section in the course about how to create editorial uh, guidelines, where to put those, some examples. Um, so that's what we can do to show trust in how our content was created. Um, and then they do say that if you use AI, like for example, if you asked AI to write you a whole article, and then you just like reviewed it and published it and like didn't really change anything. They recommend disclosing that AI was used to write the content, which I think is like nice for Google. Um, but I don't think that people are actually actively doing that right now. I've seen a couple websites where they say um, that the content was produced by AI. I think if you really genuinely just used AI to write it, sure, disclosing is probably best practice. If you used AI to outline the article or write your intro or outro or whatever, I don't really think that requires disclosing. That's not really any different than having like a VA do it for you or something. Um, so I think there's like this weird line that hasn't been like fully delineated yet in terms of like how AI disclosure is going to roll out in the future. Um, but yeah, they officially recommend to disclose it if you've used it in a substantial way in creating your content, which I agree is probably smart, but I it, there's like this blurry line of like, when does this become like, oh, AI was a significant part of my content creation. So um, not sure <laughs> where that line's gonna land, but as of right now, I very rarely see AI disclosures on any content um, on the internet. Uh, and then why was the content created? So this is perhaps the most important question to answer about your content. 
why is it being created in the first place? The why should be that you're creating content primarily to help people. Content that is useful to visitors if they come to your site directly. If you're doing this, you're aligning with EEAT generally and what our core ranking systems seek to reward. If the why is that you're primarily making content to attract search engine visits, that's not aligned with what our systems seek to reward. So I think I think also like sometimes food bloggers fall into this space as well. Like in that article um, from Casey, he mentioned that some of the trouble spots is when people started branching out into too many topics. So like one example he gave was someone who became known as like a gluten-free dessert blogger, like baking blogger. And then they started veering out into all these other topics and then they kind of lost their topical authority and they're like guiding star of like the point of their blog and then they lost ranking. So it's kind of like, who are you? What are you an expert on? And stay in your lane a little bit, <laughs> not not branch out into all these other things where it's like confusing about who would want to visit your site and what they would get out of it. So if you were a gluten-free desserts blogger and then you started branching out into like baking chicken, like... <laughs> Is that related? Should that be on the same site or should that be a separate site, if that makes sense? Um, if you use automation, including AI generation to produce content for the primary purpose of manipulating search rankings, that's a violation of our spam policies as well. So I agree if you're like, I think the people who are over, like the competitor in my niche, who's like clearly using AI to create these like massive pieces of content I think they're going to get nailed in the future. It hasn't happened yet. They grew. So they're literally like, here, let me show you this site. It's crazy. So it's called Savory Suitcase. Um, this is the site and it started as a food blog. Uh, so they have a lot of recipes. I'm. This is probably a fake person, to be honest. Um, I think there's an SEO behind this website. Um, and they started publishing all these like uh, informational pieces of content using AI. So if you if you want to see what someone's posting, you can go to their sitemap on any website and you can click on their sitemap and see what they've been publishing. And look at this, like on the 12th of August, what is this? Like 50 articles and they're all blank versus blank posts published all in the same day. Then the next day, 50 more. And then or at least there's probably like a hundred and then you know a week later a couple more and then another week later a huge batch and then another huge batch so they're like mass producing one style of content around easy keywords that they think they could rank for so like and I think this is going to get nailed in the future but they haven't gotten nailed yet and they went from 10,000 to 300,000 monthly sessions in a year uh, from this and probably are making so much money on, they're on Mediavine. Um, so I'm like, okay, they're probably like one of the people who are like, I'm just gonna milk this cash cow for as long as I can. And then it's gonna crash. And they're like, whatever, I made like $50,000. That's cool. So there's a balance here. Like, is that what you're going for? then you could like go for a cash play using AI and then like wait for it to like go down and burning flames. Or you can think long-term and like, am I building a brand? I want to have longevity. Um, so this is an example of someone's site that is working now. I don't think it will forever though. So they also then, so after they targeted that mass, like blank versus blank, uh, topic cluster, they went after a new one of how to use. So then they did a batch of how to use. Then they did a batch of how to store and I get what they're going for. They're like thinking, okay, I'm going to post a whole bunch of this type of post. So it looks like I have authority on this type of post and it's working, but I don't think it's going to work forever. So um, we'll see <laughs> how to store, how to store, how to store. It's like, does this belong on a food blog? Probably not. So I think they're going to catch on and penalize this in the future. Um, in Casey's article, he actually noticed that this type of thing with food bloggers going after these long tail informational keywords was something that got penalized. I don't know how this site <laughs> escaped that, but um, it's probably coming for them. So then they talk about pairings a zillion times. So yeah, it's very interesting to me. An example of one site that people didn't like because they were clearly gaming the system for a long time and making tons of money was insanelygoodrecipes.com. And they finally <laughs> started getting hit on this update. They were gaming the recipe cards. So 
here, let me go to insanely good. So this person has like a team of writers and again, it's a food blog, but I think what they're getting a lot of traffic from is like what to serve with type of um, posts. So for example, what to serve, we wrote a post like this <laughs> to see what would happen. Um, so they're number one. Um, but what used to come up as the first thing was what to serve with. And there was a recipe carousel and I've notice this is popping in and out of the search results. So on my phone, I think this wasn't the like main thing on my phone. It was actually showing recipes, not this like spammed recipe carousel. So this is not a recipe, what to serve with acorn squash. It's a list of things and they put it in a recipe card so that it would show up in the recipe carousel and get more clicks, which is like clearly a manipulation tactic um, that I think they're gonna, Google's gonna come down on, but they haven't yet. Um, but I'm, I know in the food blogging space, people are like, like side eyeing this hard. <laughs> and they're like, this shouldn't be here. Um, but in the meantime, it has been working for them and they've been getting a lot of traffic. But I think Google is starting to not show that in the search results. And because they depended so much on that for a lot of their traffic, that they are seeing a dip finally. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just things to think about long-term, like the back of your mind should be like, is this good for the user or am I like gaming the system a little bit? There's always the line to walk about like gaming the system to get traffic now, but then long-term is a good decision. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's an example. All right, so I'm gonna end things right here. As I mentioned, this was a super long call. So I do have more to share that I will publish in future videos. But for now, let's put a pause on this discussion. And I really hope you found it helpful. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to my channel at The Unconventional RD on YouTube for more content like this.